okay, so for those who don't know me, my name is Jesse Felberg. In addition to teaching Film 102 here on campus and torturing, you know, these few over here uh, two days a week. Uh, I'm also a filmmaker, write, direct, and uh, do production sound amongst many hats. And that's how I got to meet this wonderful person, Mel House. And I will let you introduce yourself and all the titles you like to wear and what you like to do. Okay. Um, good afternoon. My name is Mel House. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I'm originally from Baltimore, but I live in the Bronx and have for about 16 years now. Um, I am a filmmaker, an actor, a stand-up comedian, a teaching artist, and a producer. Um, and we met because I wrote a digital series which has been in development for about five years. Um, and we just filmed it this summer in August and September. Um, and so I'm excited to share a little bit about that journey, but I think what might be of interest is just like, what is it to be a creator? Mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you get those initial impulses out of your head and into the world? And how do you find collaborators? And how do you find money and resources and, and make the thing? So we can definitely talk, but also I think if you have any questions, I'm so open to sharing any part of the journey that I've had, which has been all over the map, wonderful, beautiful, hard, painful, that's the creation of art. So thank you for having me today. Yeah, thanks for coming. I'd like to, so then, um, real quick, to get a better sense of who you are, like, where did you, um, I, I always feel like, you know, acting was your original love and your original purpose, so can you talk a little bit more about, like, how you started that? Sure. Um, I saw a play when I was six years old. Someone took me to see a Chekhov play, mm. of all things. And if you're not familiar with Chekhov, those tend to be a little dark. Mm -hmm. uh, they are funny, but they're the kind of funny that like life is so painful. It's funny, there's nothing left to do but laugh. And I saw a play, it was Uncle, Uncle Vanya, mm. was actually the play I saw. And I was had wanted to be a unicorn up to that point, <laughs> six years old. And then I was like, no, no, this is the job for me. So I think that I saw adults put on dress-up clothes and play and tell a story. And people came together in a community, in a space, and the idea that that could be someone's job and that you could maybe do that with all of your time, I was, I was sold. Um, so I've, I've known for a long time that was part of my path and part of what I'm passionate about. Uh, I went to a liberal arts college called Goucher College. Um, where I was in a lot of productions. I studied abroad a lot, so I worked at Shakespeare's Globe Theater. Um, I did international tours, uh, Shakespeare tours. Um, I started a theater company in grad school, and we made theater that we took to scrappy festivals. Um, and then, uh, yeah, when I graduated, I went back to Baltimore for a little while, and I got my equity card doing uh, Much Ado About Nothing. Mm -hmm. I played Conrad, who's sort of non-binary-ish character. Mm -hmm. I had, dreadlocks at the time and was going through a very hippie phase of my own and they were like this is this is what you what you bring to our table so uh, yeah that was really fun and then I moved to New York in my late 20s so I could pursue more opportunities and just work. a few years ago right yeah just just like last week <laughs> <laughs> or 20 some years now yeah. All right. All right. I'm sorry I continue I'm just no that's okay so yes yeah, so um I studied at, uh, I, have, I have a bachelor's degree from Goucher College. I have a master's degree from the University of Exeter um, in their School of Drama. My master's is actually in applied drama, which is uh, a combination of educational theater, drama therapy, and prison theater, or using um, theatrical structures mm -hmm. in non-traditional spaces for education or recreation. Um, and alongside acting work here in the city, I've always also done teaching artist work. So I work for Lincoln Center and I work for BAM. Um, and I go in and, and work with all kinds of communities to make theater, do things around performance work. So that's sort of the acting journey. Cool. Um, so you, you, you brought up something that I, I want to like kind of highlight. Well, two, two, two things. One is point of clarification. You said equity, and that's the, just for, for people's reference, that's the theater union. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, but also, like, so you studied undergraduate and graduate in drama and acting. And I'm curious because like a lot of people, even filmmakers, like don't study anything really, graduate high school and become successful at their craft. And I'm curious maybe how you feel your academic education has maybe helped you individually, generally, in terms of you know working in the industry. Um, I wish someone had told me when I was a student that all the classes that I didn't think I wanted to take were sometimes the most important classes that I was taking. 
I always thought only the acting classes and the ones related to my major was what I was interested in and I wanted. But if I had spent more time learning languages, um, that would have fed my career, but also the way that I think about the world. Like the different classes that you're developing, as particularly in a liberal arts school, add to a more rich life. And the life that you have is what's gonna feed your art. So even if you're obsessed with films, it's what you go out and do in between making your art that gives you the ideas or the things that you care about to make art about. So I think, if anything, uh, my undergrad or all of my education made me hungry to learn and taught me the tools for how to keep learning and also how to be resourceful, like how to find the things that I need. And of course, connections, like the people that you meet in school uh, very often can, I don't know, the people that you can work with, that you build things with, who you, you meet 15 years later. I had someone from middle school donate $100 to my crowdfunding campaign in May, and we're only on touch by Facebook. Uh, so, yeah, you build community and resources and things like that. Um, so, the network thing is really interesting because how we met was by random through a class I was taking, and I gave a presentation on doing sound, and then that triggered someone to be like, oh, he knows how to do sound, and then we were looking for a sound person, she mentioned my name, and this is how, you know, this is how I got to meet Mel and, and work on the set. Uh, so you never know, like, who you're talking to, what you say you'll do, they'll be like, oh, this person does this, and, you know. And it was particularly, uh, Viviana told me that you gave a presentation in one of your classes that was so impressive to her. That's what she filed away in her head. Okay. So when she knew I was meeting with different uh, sound mixers, she was like, I think you I think you might want to talk to Jesse. Wait, so how many did you interview? I'm just curious. About three or four. <laughs> <laughs> What's your rank? Yeah, right. <laughs> that's the presentation did Marco? Yeah, yeah, that's the one. Yeah. That was a great presentation. Well, thank you. I can see why she was in that. <laughs> I was too. Yeah, so it's like when you when you talk about network, like that's also one of the reasons why so like I'm working on my MFA in film and one of the reasons why I made a very conscious choice to do that was to meet like minded people and you know make connections, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Not to belabor the point, but to belabor the point. Um, so let's maybe like jump now then to um, the production. because uh, there's so many things to talk about. The the web series alone, um, Hot Angry Mom. Uh, which is what I got to work on, which was a lot of fun. Um, so let's start with um, kind of like why you chose to to make this web series. Okay. Um, well, well, actually, actually, before before let's talk about what the web series is, and then we can talk about. Things. Great. Um, so what we've created is eight episodes of about approximately six minutes per episode, or the equivalent of like a half hour pilot. Um, and we're telling the story of Marie, who is a people-pleasing New York City mom and middle-aged actress uh, who has a bit of an anger problem. And she doesn't realize it because she suppresses her anger in order to please and take care of everyone else. Until one day, uh, she has an explosion, and her son, who's a teenager, films it because he thinks it's funny. And he puts it on the internet because he thinks it's funny to share with his friends. And the video goes viral on a very important day in her life when she's trying to reach a career goal, you know, and she feels like it's just within reach and everything keeps going wrong. And she doesn't know that there's a video going viral that expresses this thing that she tries to hide from the world. Um, so it's really a show about like what is healthy anger? Is there such a thing as healthy anger? Uh, how do you deal with trauma? Um, the, the story takes place the day after the Dr. Blasey Ford uh, testified in front of the Senate oh. Judiciary uh, Committee. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people, particularly female identifying people, were very angry. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot going on and how that impacts your life and, and you know what's happened in your past and how that translates into your, your day. Um, and there's a sort of play within the play. I'm not allowed to say the name of the play lest I get uh, copyright issues, but there's an incredible play that uh, inspired me. And this is what the character is trying to audition for in, on this day. So you see um, interwoven themes of power and, uh, and the becoming of a goddess. Um, and so yeah, it's a, it's a really fun, uh, dark comedy uh, that just gets us started on this woman facing her own anger um, and where that journey is gonna take her. So it's sort of a window into transformation. Yeah, I, I, I found it to be a fun story because it also it, it seemed to have kind of like this, in, in society like women I feel like are kind of like criticized for communicating their anger in, in almost in any way. 
like even calmly, it's just like, oh, like, like lady, like what, like why are you so angry? And you're very calm. And yours is very much like, I'm not gonna like stop and take this criticism. I'm just gonna be me and like really put it out there. Well, uh, the character is a people pleaser, but we get to see her anger through fantasy. So we have moments where we see what she's suppressing, but because the viral video is what we ultimately film, so we get to see her really rage and let out sort of an explosion. And, and anger is a, a biological event that happens to all of us. It's not in and of itself unhealthy. It's actually quite healthy. If you can listen to your own anger, I think that because many of us have been taught that it's bad, we suppress it or ignore it or don't actually listen to it and that causes behavior like aggression and tantrums and things that um, are actually dangerous. So it's kind of fun that even though we're using comedy as a way into it, getting people to think about uh, how you get in touch with yourself, how you really listen to yourself um, and that, that anger can actually be positive because it's, um, it's a connective emotion that takes us out of ourselves and causes us to reach towards others. Um, so. So I'm curious, um, it, it feels like there's a, many elements of this story that are like personal to you, that you um, are comfortable sharing, and I know like for a lot of people in general, it's difficult being vulnerable, especially in, in an art setting, it's even more difficult to be vulnerable, and you can mask it in so many ways through story. But um, what I wish I had learned earlier in life was that to kind of embrace the idea of being vulnerable and people who mistreat it, that's on them, and you know, I shouldn't like let that stop me. But if you can kind of like talk maybe about and if you've had plenty of experience of course, but being vulnerable, not only about your personal story, but as an artist, as an actor, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay. Um so I did not have a video go viral of me, but I am really angry. Um and it took me a while to realize that and try to figure out what to do with that sort of energy. Um Writing was uh, maybe started off as a little bit of a therapeutic tool, but I actually did stand up comedy. I do stand up comedy, but I did a character and I called her Hot Angry Mom, and it was very angry comedy, and people loved it. People could relate to the things that I was talking about. Um, uh, and so you're, you're talking about vulnerability as well, but that's part of acting training is to realize that everything you hide from everyone else because you think that there's something wrong with you or shameful or embarrassing is exactly what everyone else wants to see about you. And when you share it, you create connection for all of the things that, it, it allows us to be more human. So it's a very generous act to be a performer. And when you're working with actors on your set, um, just thinking about how you can give them enough space so that they feel safe to open up and slow down and trust themselves with compliments, finding what's working that you like in someone's performance is really helpful to help them open up. Um, but then, you know, if you're writing too, and some of you are writers, writing your truth and sharing the things that you're like, oh, should I be saying this out loud? Um, it's, it's beautiful to get it out and then to find your core people that you can trust to look at it with you and say, yes, this is something we all want to hear, or maybe it's a bit soon for this material. Um, it, can, it can take a little bit of a dance. Um, but uh, yeah, I think vulnerability is just being honest and being open and being willing to share and knowing that it, it, is, it is a generous act. Um, so, Lot, when, you, when, you, when you set out to make a, a, a web series, and any piece of art, uh, film specifically, I always feel like um, you should have a goal in mind. Like, why are you making this? And so for some of you guys, it's like, oh, I have to because it's my assignment. That's why I'm doing it, and that's very fair. But for you, it's not an assignment. You've chosen to do this. And uh, really, the question is, like, what were you hoping to gain from it? Yeah. I think I started to write because I, I felt like I had to save my life emotionally like it was uh there were things in my life that i needed to get more clear on and understand and writing was a, a, a beautiful pathway on top of that i'm an actor and uh i guess the origin story for hot angry mom uh be it began i was uh getting close to my 40th birthday um and i was working in an off-broadway theater making pretty much less than minimum wage when you realize how many hours an actor puts into their performance and we were in a 99 seat house. Uh, it was cold, like the heat wasn't working. I was working with a 
Tony Award winning director. This play was about race and gender. It was a bunch of short plays, but it was beautiful material and it should have been fulfilling and it should have been awesome. But I wasn't earning a lot of money. The theater was cold. People would come in late and uh, they would like, while you're like bearing your soul and having this intense scene and they would walk across the front of the stage and sit down. And I, I had one day before a performance when I was doing a warm up. Um, and, and I do something called Fitzmorris, which is a voice technique. And so it looks a little silly if you see someone doing it. I actually put it in the series. <laughs> it was the first shot that we took. Um, but I was in something that looks like plow pose in yoga and like making vocal sounds, which make you laugh and cry. It looks ridiculous. But uh, it's part of opening up your instrument. And uh, the person who was the stage manager came in and she wanted to talk to me because she found naked pictures of her sister on her computer when her sister accidentally plugged the computer in and she wanted advice because I'm a mother of like how to handle this situation and what to do. And I started telling stories about the first time we found pornography on my son's phone when he was like 11. And before I knew it, everyone <laughs> in the theater was telling stories and laughing and cry kind of crying with laughter. And I was like, oh, I am an angry mom. Like that's who I am. And I have all these stories that I want to tell people because it, as an actor particularly, you can become a person who's always telling other people's stories. Um, and you can feel a little bit like an object. Uh, and I suddenly wanted to be the author of the stories. I wanted to be able to write. And when I first began writing, I, again, I did stand up first uh, and found that the character, it resonated with people that I would not have thought my, the, it would resonate with. My humor resonated with like 25 year old men in an open mic who were usually just focusing on their own jokes. I'm like, and, and I would tell labor jokes. <laughs> and so I was kind of surprised that, you know, and people who maybe have very different sort of political leanings than I do were also really laughing at, at my material. Um, and so I, I then wanted to take it and turn it into vignettes and stories. So I took a class just to begin to write it out and wrote an episode that I was so excited I wanted to be able to make it. Um, and uh, some friends introduced me to Labs. So Sundance has a, a New Voices Lab. Orchard Project has an episodic lab. So four web series, which felt like short form content, which felt attainable for someone with my skill set. Um, so I actually hired a crew, shot a pitch video, and was a finalist for Sundance's New Voices Lab and for Orchard Project's Episodic Lab in 2019. And that was just enough encouragement to, to get me to keep working on it. Um, I created a YouTube channel. Woo! <laughs> um, I, I, I make that sound because I put out videos that maybe weren't polished, they were raw, and that's vulnerable and scary. But I made a new video every week from September through January of 2019 into 2020. And it made me have to think of an idea. It made me have to shoot something. I, had, I edited it myself. I developed all of those skills. And then I published it. And I had to like promote it. And just the act of learning how to do all of those things was wildly helpful. But the reason I did it was because I was trying to figure out how to build an audience for the web series that I was continuing to write. So I took classes in distribution. Like, what am I gonna do with this project once I make it? Who's gonna even wanna watch it? Can I make money from this? Or am I just gonna sink more and more of my own money into creating the project? So I took fundraising classes, distribution classes, um, uh, marketing type classes. Um, and then um, the pandemic hit, everything sort of shut down. But what that did give me was a chance to go deeper with my writing. Um, and so I worked with a mentor from Sundance uh, two women, actually, uh, who both work in network television, who read my scripts every week for weeks and gave me notes and feedback and I sort of played with structure and, and experimented. And so about a year ago, this time, a little, little more than that, I had a script that I knew was great. <laughs> it was very good and I was ready to make it. Um, and so I began putting together a team. I did a crowdfunding campaign and raised about $35,000 last May. Um, and then I went into pre-production all summer, hiring the right folks, finding all of the locations, because you know, 40,000 might sound like a lot, but it's really nothing. It's very scrappy. So I had to do a lot of the jobs myself. Um, and I think we started August 22nd or 1st was our first day of principal photography. We shot over three weekends, but because of hurricanes and tornadoes and floods, we had to reschedule a little bit and do some pickups. 
And so we finished maybe September 8th, I think? Yeah, sounds, yeah, uh, just recently. Yeah. And my goal for the project is to have a, a pass of it ready for the Tribeca Film Festival um, to see, because they, they their requirement is that if you wanted to screen with Tribeca, it has to be a world premiere. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's kind of what the team is hoping uh, will be the first step in a festival plan for the series. Let me know, I'll get my touch ready. I'm excited. Uh, I'm excited for you. Uh, so many great things. So one thing, uh, quick, quick thought is, the year really gave me an opportunity to keep on rewriting and really like hone the story. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you can add anything to that. I think the only thing I want to say is, I think it, who gives you feedback matters. I mean, I'm actually part of a writer's group, so I was having those pages, I was having pages read aloud every three weeks for at least a year by, with, by professional actors. We, we formed a group, we would meet every three weeks, we'd read pages of different people's material, not just mine. Um, but that helped me hear it and begin to shape it myself. But the mentors that I worked with at the end were so good at finding what was working. And for me, personally, that's the kind of feedback that I need. They also, there were also things that weren't working at times or needed to be structured, but I was able to figure out a lot of what that was and solve them. And instead of feeling like I was doing something wrong that had to be fixed, instead I felt excited to create. Um, because of the way the feedback was looking at what was working and like the, the sort of idea of like, what else? What if you try this? What if you went here? What is the most you could imagine, you know, this scenario? What, how far could you push in this direction or that direction? And that was all very exciting to me. Um, and I, I, I had an incredible time writing this, which I hope uh, shows when people read it. Um, I see it. Um, okay, so to, to keep the producer's head on for a moment, so you spend a long time writing it, developing it, um, fundraising, which I'm sure was a, a, a quite an emotional roller coaster, uh, and and you know basically doing a lot of the producing, hiring the crew, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So now you show up to set, having spent so much energy, and it's like it's your baby, and so now you're so emotionally like connected to this story, like how then you you basically you know. It's so, okay, now I need to act. <laughs> kind of like, how like how does that work? How did it work for you? Um, it was a little messy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was hoping to, to have enough support that when I showed up to set, I could only act. Um, but I made some poor hiring decisions, which you can only know when you go through it. Mm -hmm. It's incredible if you can develop your relationships and work with people so you can get a sense of their style of working because you really want people that you can communicate effectively with, um, that have a similar work ethic to you. And it takes a lot of like communication and time and trust to get to that. And sometimes when you're working on something low budget, those are the things you don't have is a lot of time. Um, but I, I definitely brought, uh, I brought two young producers on board who were very excited about the idea of producing. But when it came time to some of the actual labor, they didn't have all of the skills that that I just assumed that they had. So sometimes I had to do more of the job than I was hoping to. So for instance, I would get up at four in the morning um, and I would do a, a good physical warm up. Um, I did have hair and makeup for about half of the shoot, but for the second half, I did not have hair and makeup. Um, and that was a COVID related thing that happened with the person who couldn't continue. Um, so then I was doing my own hair and makeup and trying to match what someone else had created for the first half of the shoot. Um, and then I actually had the entire van and all of the gear. Um, I wrote a grant to Panavision, who gave me the new filmmaker grant, so we used the Alexa Mini, which is a wonderful camera. Um, but I had all of the camera gear and the sound gear and the crafty and the costumes and the props inside a van that I, with my family, loaded and unloaded. And then we would drive and pick up breakfast on the way to set to feed everyone, do the unloading, and then you know be at whatever set we were at. And I had just about enough time to change clothes, get mic'd, and then walk on the set. Um, something that helps me is I have 20 years training as an actor. I've worked off Broadway, I've worked internationally, I've worked on television shows, I've worked in film. So um, there is something to the repetition that gets into your muscle memory. Um, but the beautiful thing was my character was a really stressed out, angry mom. So if things weren't going well, or I was worried about something on set, I could pull from that and just be me. And the character was, and maybe I didn't even say this, is inspired by me and my family. 
um, I do have a, a teenage son, and uh, I am married, and so some of, and I'm in a multiracial family, which is some of the layers of complexity in the longer form story, not so much in what we, we shot in here. And I would just say, like, you would show up and you were like all smiling, like ready to go, and I was like, oh my god, how is she doing this? Uh, so, uh, well, good job. Um, Thank you. Say that. <laughs> Not that you need my approval. But I did, um, I did also, I mean, I, I mentioned two producers who maybe didn't do some of the things I wanted, but what I didn't actually say was I had an incredible DP, an incredible director, an incredible sound person, um, people who did really pitch in, work hard, work through long days, had a sense of humor. And so the, there was a really incredible core team on this. Um, and the director and I actually met when she was in grad school doing, she went to NYU, and I was in her thesis film 13 years ago. Mm -hmm. And now we're both moms and multiracial families who struggle with the balance of trying to make art when you have a family and with other similar themes that are inside this series. Um, and so I reached out to her. Um, I knew that I had a pretty ambitious festival goals as well, and I do know that she's had film She's the 2020 Adrian Shelley Trebekah film like award winner. She's had films at Trebekah. She's had films at Sundance. So I also like drew on some folks who had um, some experience with where I wanted to be, um, and they layered into the project as well. And a lot of the actors in the project are Broadway and television performers regularly um, because I'm in a company, and a lot of them are are friends of mine that work in a company with me. So I was able to easily access talent for this particular production, but it took 20 years of, of struggling and working on things to be at that point where I could do that. Yeah, and still, and still like, you know, with, with those, not to, um, those, those other producers who kind of like weren't the best match, right? You still had like collected, for lack of a better word, like all these other people along the way that made up the core team that even with a couple of people who weren't pitching in as much or in the way you would have hoped, you still had enough people to kind of like carry you through. Absolutely. Um, and that's that's always wonderful. I always feel like uh, I meet people and I'm like, oh my god, you're gonna be my new best friend. We're gonna do everything together. And then they say something, and you're like, oh, maybe not. Mm -hmm. We're still, we'll, we'll still go out and have a beer. But I'm like, I don't know if I really want to like, you know, be attached to you like <laughs> this one project, you know, for for how many years it would take. Um, so I'd like to ask. Um, this is a question that uh, a lot of I see a lot of people ask um, that I find really annoying, but I'm going to ask you for purposely. Okay. Is uh, how do you get an agent or manager? Um, so I got my agent through a referral. Um, I actually did a benefit performance um, and met someone who was another actor. Who we went out for drinks afterwards, and he was like, "Oh, like who are you working with?" And I was like, uh, "What do you mean? I'm working with myself." Um, and he was like, "You're incredible. Like, let me let me connect you to my agent." And I was a little overwhelmed at the time because so I was like, "Oh, I need new headshots." I'm like, a bunch of excuses came up, and he asked me three times before I followed through. So I kind of got lucky because you should always be ready to follow through right away. But I sent that my headshot and resume after a couple of requests, and then. Um, uh, my, my agent, my now agent, invited me into the office, took a look at my headshot and resume, and read me in a minute. Meaning, my resume was full of all of my educational credits. It was a very academic looking resume, but I also had some strong theater credits. And she was like, you work too hard. You are trying to prove yourself to everyone. I can see that now. And I, you, she was like, go and erase all of this from your resume. You have professional credits. Let them stand on your own. Please get new headshots. Get back to me when you do. So a couple weeks later, I got back to her and then she was like, great, let me come in and let me see you work. Um, and so I had been in a class, I'm always in workshops, I'm always working. Like I'm always, even if I'm not on a set, I'm in some type of class, like practicing. Um, and so I had done a class and worked on a scene from good people um, uh, and brought in my scene partner from that and we did a scene from that and she would, like signed me immediately. Um, so we've been working together ever since. Um, I do have sometimes referrals to like other agents and managers and I consider like do I want to have like secondary teams and that but referral is the strongest way. I, th I think people hunt so hard to try to find someone but I feel like when it's right for you they're you're gonna make that connection. You can write letters of introduction, you can do pay to play type classes but I, I think referrals if you can so, tell people that's what you want. And so how long have you been like acting? How many, oh. how many years? 
seven. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, some people right out of their school programs can connect with agents, depending on if your school has a showcase or that kind of thing. I'm no, I had had I had freelance with a couple of agents before her, um, but they weren't particularly successful relationships. <laughs> but I think it's because I didn't understand that it's a, it's an effort. Like you're working with another person, so you have to find out like how do you want me to communicate with you. What do you see my job being in this relationship? You have to know what you want from them and be able to tell them, like, this is what I should go out for. These are the projects I want to work on. Can you get access to that? What do you need from me to be able to do that? And so, um, yeah, learning even to have those conversations took me, I don't know how many years that I wish I had known them. Um, so the, the theme again of like, it's got to be the right connection. It's got to be a good match or it doesn't, it's not really going to make sense. Yeah, but you can research people and you can reach out to anyone and you should. Your heroes, people that you think are un like inaccessible because you never know who will actually write back, who will take a meeting with you, who will hire you for a job. Uh, so I would definitely say ask. Be polite, be friendly, be naturally curious. But if you're passionate, especially when you're still a student or you're younger or you're coming out of a program, people want to help you. So if you come from a place of genuine curiosity of this is where I'm at, and you know yourself, you're comfortable with wherever you are, don't ever pretend to be further along or to know more or to be more polished or shiny than you are, because wherever you are is actually perfect. And if you're honest about that and you share what you need and you want, other people will really want to help you. And I definitely didn't know that. and definitely tried to be better than I thought I was afraid, <laughs> you know, if that makes sense. And, and people also get see that even if you don't realize that they can see that. Cool. I mean, that, that was my, my next question would be like advice for spying actors, but I feel like you've covered that as well. Um, it's just, to, yeah, work. F find your people and make, make work. And there's, like, today you can, right? If you have a pen and a piece of paper, you can start writing. If you have a laptop, ooh, what you can't do. Final draft, final cut. Like, you, you know, your phone, you can make... You can make short films on your phone. You could make a challenge to do a one minute, you know, TikTok. You know, but those can actually develop your storytelling skills, your ideas about what you want to talk about. Any anything can become an art project. Um, I'll share this with you. Uh, I was just teaching at the University of Dubuque in Iowa, and we did um, we did a little prompt about tell the story of your life. But uh, in three minutes, there was a, like eight different prompts I think I gave to people. Uh, one of them was uh, like 10 words, 10 places, 10 dreams you have for yourself, 10 things you wish you could see in the world. And so you would pick one of these prompts and then take three minutes and answer it. And in that, you're telling something about the story of your life, who you are, what is meaningful for you. And then you can translate them into social media and like make Instagram photos that show 10 things that you think are beautiful. Or, uh, you know, it's, it, it is a part of the storytelling process. But once you get excited about something, that you want to keep putting your energy into. I mean, I've been working on Hunting Mom for five years, and that's because the themes just keep becoming more and more relevant to the world I see around me, and my skills have developed so much in that time. Um, it's kind of like that, uh, makes me think of that joke, you know, how to get to Carnegie Hall, practice, practice, practice. Um, as a writer, you should write, like, try to write, like, five minutes a day at least, every day. Um, but also lean into the joy and the pleasure of it without judging it too much. Like, sure. you have to make so much bad stuff before something is air quotes good. And even when you make something that's good or great, there's so many people who are going to tell you it's no good. <laughs> so you also have to like believe in yourself and if it speaks to you and it excites you, it will excite and find an audience somewhere out there as well. Yeah, it's a writing is a muscle, hacking is a muscle, all these muscles that you have to exercise, you know, feed, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> and you know it will get stronger and when you need to use it it's there kind of like to your point too for being an, an, an actor for so many years and having to like then go from producer to acting on set you, 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 you develop that muscle so well it's very easy to transition you know in a few minutes um and also like to, to the point of of um getting feedback and you know people who want to poop on your ideas it's like definitely got to be careful uh with what people say and how it affects you. I think you know, or at least for me, if feedback is right, it resonates and it excites me and it makes me want to work and it makes me want to go back. If it makes me feel bad and shut down, probably it was about the other person. And if I can let it go and ignore it, 
because you just don't have to take all of it. <laughs> like other people aren't right just because they're not you. <laughs> it's just something I just still have to remind myself. So, so in, in hearing you that with that, there's like another theme here, and that's also being emotionally present. You know, in so many steps, but you know whether it's. It's the stories that you know you're attracted to, and the responses to those ideas, and um, listening to yourself and what works and what doesn't work, or or listening to other people and like, well, why are they saying this? Do do I like it or I don't like it? Why don't I like it? And kind of like being able to have that inner dialogue and and navigate the, whatever emotional response that might occur during you know, said conversation with yourself or other people. Um, I want to think. I have one more question. So, if you guys have any questions or thinking about it, um, oh, I know. So, so this was a, this was definitely a huge uh, undertaking, and I'm sure you've learned so much, right? Because <laughs> yes. as you continue to do, you're constantly learning and growing. And I'm curious, uh, what did you learn? Like, what would you do differently? Like, what are your takeaways? <laughs> oh, that's a big one. Well, I mean, I. Something that I had for myself, which was new, was just grace. Everything I did was the best that I could do because I, with the knowledge that I had going into it. So I am very proud of everything that I, that I did. Um, things that I would change, I would do the script breakdown myself. I wouldn't have outsourced that to someone else. Script, uh, ex ex script breakdown, will you explain that to some people? Before? Sure. Um, so literally looking at, um, uh, when you're trying to think about scheduling your shoot and how much you're going to be able to cover in a day, you're going to look at quarter pages, half pages, three quarter pages, full pages, how, how much time each scene is going to take. And I would say for an independent project, to be human, which we weren't always, <laughs> we weren't always, try not to shoot more than three, maybe three and a half pages a day which is hard if you're like, oh, I don't have a lot of money and, and I only have so much time at a location. That gets really tricky. Um, I outsourced my script breakdown and the person who broke it down did it based on her own experience and thoughts about how we were filming things. Um, and so we, we scheduled only seven days for what we probably should have had 10 days for, um, which just meant that that's long days but then there's a different kind of tension and pressure. And it doesn't allow for the spontaneity that, and the, the kind of things that you want to discover on, on set, which you just need a little bit of space for everyone's nervous system to work together and to be really effective. So I would figure out how to give myself, how, how to give everyone more time. Uh, I would think differently about the pay scale for everyone on my crew. Um, I come from theater, so all the time we work and we don't get paid, or we get paid very little over and over again. But film is a little different, and I think um, understanding how overtime is calculated, really going into that and making sure that every single person on set is making at least minimum wage, which is at least $210 a day no matter what their job is, is something that I would make a priority in planning. I couldn't have done this project if that was, yeah. like, the way that we did things initially. I had people who volunteered their labor just because they wanted to work on the set. And some of those people were incredible. And some of those people maybe cost me money in different ways. <laughs> so um, I would allocate my resources a little differently, just something to learn about, about my budgeting. Um, and I would be careful who I listen to. I saw this, I'm a, I'm a theater maker, I'm a collaborative person. I want to hear everybody's ideas, I want to include everybody's ideas, I yes and, a big improv person. And something that because I was the executive producer of this and because I was the writer of this and because it was based on me, I, I wish I had, at the end of the day, assumed full responsibility and been able to say no more, like, no, we're not doing that. This is my project, we're doing this. In a, in a way that, um, I think I did about halfway through the shoot, and I probably, hopefully could, going into another project, but I just had to learn it by doing it, because I tried to please everyone. They didn't like the breakfast, can I get more of this breakfast? They need this, they need that, like, Cool. That was me with the breakfast. That was <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't a big deal. But I, but I definitely was trying so hard to please everyone else, and, and sometimes I should have been asking, what do I need? That's the talent and the person doing all these other things. Um, yeah, so that's something I think I would do a little bit. Striking the balance again. 
Yeah. And, and I would have more tone meetings because I hired a director who was not me. Mm -hmm. I, would have, I would have tone meetings with the director to really get our vision on the same page. I, I brought on an incredible director. She's incredible. But her and our camera person made the production value primary. And for me, maybe the storytelling and acting was a little more primary. And the storytelling and acting kind of became secondary to what was their priority, even though it was my project. And so that would have taken better communication before being on set to get get into a sync into a, a synchron synchronistic place. Um, although I guess I didn't realize some of those things till we were on set, <laughs> and that might be true of every project you make. Yeah, I mean, I definitely I remember we had a conversation I think over the first week, and you were processing some things. And then I was like, oh yeah, the good point, good point. I, you know, makes sense what you're saying. And then for me, there was like kind of this shift later on. I was like, okay, good. This seems to like, you know, there was a conversation that was we had. But like that goes kind of back to um, knowing what your vision is and trusting yourself and being able to say, okay, this isn't working for me because this is how I saw it. And you saw it could still be a conversation, of course, ideally. But be, but still just like kind of like taking that stand and be like, this isn't working for me. Be like, here's why, like, what can we do to, you know, bring it closer to my vision and how, how I see it. And I know that for me, like early on when I would do stuff, I would, the, the actor would do something and I'd be like, uh, okay. And then I'd get to the editing and I was like, oh, this is like not what I wanted at <laughs> all. Yeah, yeah. Uh, are there, anybody have any questions? Because I keep on asking all, like for hours. Talk to Mel for hours. Or you could also tell us something that you're making or want to make. Oh, this is more of a general question. Um, but you've been acting for a while now, and as someone who's like just always been curious, one of my first questions when it comes to like getting into the industry in general is like, how do you start? You know, starting has always been like um, a hard thing for me and a lot of other people to do. Like, where do you put your first foot forward? Um, and so I just want to ask you, like, even though you have all this experience and all these years doing this, is there ever a moment where you kind of like revert back to your roots, or like you kind of just like think about like how you started and use some of that like going forward? Um, I th I think it, it, it yeah it co it comes and goes. I think when I think about. I mean, I think always going back to play and this the source of joy is so important. Um, I think there's some, I, part of my training is Meisner training, uh, which if anyone ever hears of this, something that they do with young Meisner actors is repetition. Uh, so you, you notice something about the other person and you make a statement and the other piece, person repeats the statement and you keep repeating it until something changes. Um, but what you're what you're trying to develop in that skill is your is not is your power of observation, also listening, allowing something to change you and have a strong point of view. Um, but something in that training favors giant emotions and negative emotions. So screaming and crying and you know a lot of times young actors want to feel the big <coughs> operatic feelings uh, and access them, which is really really exciting. But I think. Um, there's something in joy and play and positive choices that doesn't get trained enough in actors unless you do a lot of clown workshops, which then may be so. Um, so, so I guess um, I, I take a lot of workshops still. I'm part of something called the Actor Center Company, and we do voice workshops and clowning workshops and, um, and scene study classes. And I think having a space where you work with peers um, and you can fail forward and you risk being terrible, rather than trying to go in and always be good. You go in and try to do the thing that you don't know how to do, or that you're afraid of, or you know you're gonna be bad at, um, and push into that, because uh, it's exciting when suddenly it's not bad, it's actually really good, it's really fun. Um, but yeah, I just keep making spaces to play. And if going back to your roots means telling a particular kind of story, or working with a particular community of people, or finding people who resonate with your heart in a certain way, I would. Highly recommend it. So I, I have a question about the visual language of the piece, and I know that you you know mentioned that the cinematographer and director sort of <laughs> put their their They're great though. Like, yeah, no, yeah, I understand yeah, yeah. that completely. No, no, I understand. But but I mean, ultimately, you know, 
I know you didn't have really a tone meeting, but was there any conversation about, you know, or did you have mood boards? Did you put together a lookbook? I mean, is there anything that, you know, you had as a tool creating this series, not only the script, but other visual aids? Yes, because in the many classes I took in the five years to learn about how to do this, I took pitch classes. Mm -hmm. Um, so I actually put together a pitch deck, and you can see pieces of it. If you go to hotangrymom.com, that'll take you to our crowdfunding page on Seed and Spark. But it has, there's actually uh, pictures from our pitch deck. Um, so I shot the pitch video, so I was able to use some real pictures of real actors who were part of that. Um, but then I also worked on trying to find the right language and images. Mm -hmm. So I would use comps of like flea bag meets I may destroy you for moms as just a real quick window into like what the tone of this is. We're breaking the fourth wall. We're bringing you into someone's inner life. It's one main character. She might be accessing some trauma mm -hmm. along the way. You kind of follow some of this. Um, so we had the script. We talked about the themes, but I think I hired her officially in February of 2021. Mm -hmm. And we our, meet, our talks about the story were just like this. Yeah. Um, and she had the pitch deck and she was part of the crowdfunding campaign and we rehearsed. We rehearsed online through Zoom mm -hmm. for maybe six weeks because we rehearsed every single scene at least once. All the all the day players got at least one That's rehearsal really by Zoom. really nice. And then the, um, this, this is something you might continue to use if you can't afford rehearsal yeah. spaces. It's something to start with. Um, but then all of the supporting characters, we had at least two rehearsals. And the person who played my husband and my son, we had like three rehearsals <laughs> together. And then there was one sort of intimacy fight choreography scene, and that was the one we did in person. I hired an intimacy coordinator, um, and we we met multiple times and had an in-person rehearsal because it was very, very physical, and it had to be very specific um, in order to be filmed quickly and safely because of the nature of what we were, what we were filming. Um, yeah, did I? No, did I feel like I, I lost oh, my train of thought. Pitch deck and the oh yeah, so yeah. so we did have those, and in the rehearsals, I would try to talk. I'd be like, hmm, I hear it this way. Like mm -hmm. I see this, and my director's first language is in English. Okay. So I think sometimes things that humor, the humor was funny to me, yeah. may not have landed for her in mm -hmm. the same way. Mm -hmm. But also, she has a visual filmmaking language that's far more developed than yeah. my visual filmmaking language. Mm -hmm. And when she's thinking about how to cover a scene, she was already thinking about the edit. Mm -hmm. Whereas I wrote it very specifically. We see this, we hear this, yeah. and then this happens. And there was a really strong rhythm to mm -hmm. my writing. I'm worried, <laughs> as we're in post, mm -hmm. how are we going to find that rhythm? Mm -hmm. However, I have been told, and I am trusting, I have an incredible <laughs> editor, that the editor is the person who's going to help us get that rhythm um, yeah. to the extent that we've covered it all. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I mean, we, we teach here as well that, you know, sometimes in that edits, that's, that's the final time you get to rewrite your film at, or your project or whatever. Yeah. So, I, you know, I'm crossing fingers for you. But also, coming from the theater, you know, you have a sense of rhythm that's just naturally there that, you know, filmmakers don't always understand as well. So you hear things and see things a little bit, you know, from, from a different perspective than, than they would. And then matching that up is very interesting to hear what, what that was for you. Yeah, I, and this the, uh, this level of the editing process is new for me. Mm -hmm. um, the only project I've done before this as the filmmaker was a, a documentary short. It's mm -hmm. about 11, 12 minutes long. Um, and I did edit that mm -hmm. with others to get sure. them. It was, it was a small team, but we worked collaboratively. And this is very different. You know, for a documentary, I had 40 pages of typed notes that mm -hmm. we put into index cards to try to figure out what the story arc was going to be based on our visual footage. And out of 40 pages of notes, we only had 11 index cards wow. as the total text of this incredible thing. Um, so that was like a whittling down process that was really interesting. But I'm brand new right now. I have no idea what I'm sure. doing as we go into editing, except you know I know what my vision is. Mm -hmm. I've learned that I need to trust it because of everything we've just gone through. And um, I guess the thing I also really learned from this process is to always ask more questions. Mm -hmm. Maybe even before I make decisions, like just keep asking questions. Thank you. That's, and that's great. That's great for any position. If you're a producer and you don't know what's going on, ask questions. If you're a director, an actor, anyone on set, like ask, ask, ask. Mm -hmm. Because even because if you're thinking about it, maybe someone else is thinking about it, and then asking that question might trip. Oh, you know what? That's a great question. Like let's figure this out. I mean, it also kind of circles back to like communication and sharing your vision, et cetera, et cetera.
Any other questions? I want to ask you a little bit more about your career in stand-up comedy and how you got started there. Class. I took a class. Um, and I think there was a showcase at uh, the Village Underground, actually, which is a great comedy club uh, on, in the Billet, West Village. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, they have student B shows, and you bring a couple of people, and, and you start doing it that way. Um, and then open mics, there's open mics all over the city. You can do an open mic any night of the week. So if you Google open mics New York City, sometimes they charge money like $3 or $5. Um, the open mics are just comics, usually, who are all trying to practice their material and who don't listen to each other. <laughs> and so it's hard to get a good sense of whether your material's landing. You know it's really good if anyone laughs because you caught their attention for a moment. But you can get up on stage with a mic and sort of practice that way. And then they'll have showcasing nights that you can um, be part of. And then uh, people started referring me uh, and booking because maybe they were like, ooh, you have this like angry mom thing. Like that's going to work for my night. So then friends would bring me on to their shows. Um, and I'll still, I, I haven't been doing, I haven't done stand up since before the pandemic, but I'm just getting requests again. And it's not my main sort of career path, but it's incredible because it's terrifying. And you have to learn to trust yourself, no matter how well rehearsed and like you get it, the audience is there. And you have to like work with them and you end up becoming quick on your feet, even if you're terrified. Like if you just show everyone you're terrified, but you keep it going, like that kind of can work too. Like you can, and that has to do with like clown work, but it's like, you know, everyone can see the truth of what's happening for you a lot of times, even if you hide it. So if you lean into it, that's helpful on stage. Um, but I think uh, Rick Crome teaches a uh, stand-up comedy class. Caroline's on Broadway teaches comedy. Yeah, you'll find a lot of classes if you Google it. I have a follow-up question on that, but there was a question back there. Uh, no, not, not anymore. <laughs> like after the after the stand-up thing, it's like I don't. So I'm I'm curious then um, to follow up on the stand-up thing. Like, where, at what point in your career, your life, did you do stand-up? And, and then, like, I, I only imagine, like, being a trained actor probably has influenced a lot of your stand-up performance, and, and I'm wondering, like, how that, how that looked. Um, I think I was in about 33 or something, I think, the first time I tried to do stand-up, and I think I really just wanted to do something that scared me. Um, I think I wanted to try to give up control. There's so much of me that wants to, like, control and control everything. And so knowing that, I was like, all right, how do I bring myself down from this or give myself an experience where I can't be in control of it um, and or just fail forward and have grace for myself. Um, and so stand-up was sort of my way in. Uh, I actually didn't fail as hard as I expected to. Like, I just got really positive responses like right away. But I think it's because I have a, the sense of rhythm. But also, um, I would really look at the audience and then adjust to the energy of the audience, um, which is something that I think you learn as a theater actor over time, like how to do some of that. Uh, I did have everything memorized word for word, and I tried to stay on a train of control anyway. <laughs> um, uh, but I, you know, understood about contrast and like things that make people laugh. Like I understood the principles behind them and what you do to, to kind of make that happen. Um, but it's terrifying, and it's so great. You should all, you should do it. You should do it. <laughs> So as soon as the first the first person doesn't laugh at my jokes, I'm like, oh, that's it, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> anybody, anybody? Yeah. You mentioned that you studied you studied abroad when in college. Mm -hmm. What did you do to evolve or like understand theater in that country? Yeah. So um, my first study abroad was just a three week program in Greece. Um, so we did a lot of reading, and then we went and visited like the, the theater at Epidavros, and like actually went to sites so that we could experience them. Um, Greek theater studies, classical Greek theater was a part of my sort of education. Um, but I think what you're saying is if you're going into, um, uh, so I studied in Greece, I studied in Australia, so we have a similar language, different culture. Um, I did a six-week program at NIDA, uh, which is the National Institute of Dramatic Arts, and that was amazing it was a really amazing program very very talented people and then i did a month at the globe theater so all of those were um, english speaking or english first language uh, countries um, and then i did a year abroad at the university of exeter which is also in england um but i, I guess studying history not just theater history but the history and, and that's something i love actually about acting 
um, that I don't think people think about when you think about actors, but actors tend to have a decent knowledge of history because you're going to do plays or films or things from different periods in history. And when you do, you need to research it and understand everything about that time and, in turn, and including how to like change your voice and your speech rhythms and patterns. So um, I've performed in festivals in other countries, but they were always short. It wasn't quite as immersive. Um, I was in a play right before the pandemic shut down that uh, we went to Serbia. It's a play about same-sex parenting and um, where they are with LGBTQI rights is uh, not quite as progressive or as open or as, as equal as New York or the United States. Um, so it was really interesting engaging with those audiences uh, for whom certain things were still illegal and sort of navigating that, but reading what you can, asking lots of questions. There are different forms. Good theater training will have forms from all over the world. And I think a lot of programs are getting better at increasing the range of plays. So it's not just the Anglo world. It, it can end being studied in theater programs. Um, people are expanding out of that, but um, I think things that tend to get taught, there's a little bit of like, no theaters and Japanese theater tends to be parts of curriculum. Some um, uh, different, like kabuki and puppets, can be part of that. Uh, I studied in Bali actually. Mm -hmm. I did that. I forgot about that uh, for a month. That wasn't a student thing though. I did that like two years ago. Uh, but I studied Balinese dance for a month and that was amazing. Um, but I studied with people who wanted to share their love of Balinese dance and we danced for eight hours a day. And um, I had to be dressed in traditional costume and makeup to, to understand what the stories and the characters were and, and go into villages and like watch other people dance and watch other people's celebrations and some people were very generous to include me into learning what that was like. Um, that yeah. Any other questions? I have one. Anybody? So what I was, was what made me think of when you were uh, studying abroad in like Balinese dance mm. is um, so as an actor, you can pull from all these different artistic kind of like experiences um, for whatever reason. And, as, and, and my analogy is like as a, as a filmmaker, it's kind of the same thing. The more you know about this and this and this and this, when you go to you know do the scene, you, you have that, that breadth and knowledge to kind of like give it life beyond just like, you know, what's on the page. Um, and... Um, I guess that's not really a question, I guess it's more of a statement, but uh, it just made me think like how like an actor kind of like does the same thing. Um, but also, as you were, you were talking about uh, theater, for me also theater actors are interesting because um, you get instant feedback on the stage, you don't get that behind the camera. So you, you wanna talk a little, like for me I always find like, uh, when I, especially when I do uh, casting, I'm like, oh, you're, you're th you have theater training, like you did theater? I'm like, okay, automatically I feel like you're gonna be, I hate to say it's like a better actor than someone who's only just on, on camera. Well, I think it's different, it's a, it's a difference of degree. Um, when you're on camera, your energy, or energy's not the right word, but I wanna, I wanna, I'm gonna use the number one. It's, 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 it's your, you think the thoughts, you don't have to do as much. Mm -hmm. um, you do have to be very specific, and the camera can see everything that you're thinking and feeling. But and, and you still want to have actions. You still want to plead or seduce or you know. Um, but but you're you're you need to be present in a different way, and you're looking at smaller units of time, and you also have to be able to repeat yourself. And, and this was the thing that was a little is a little frustrating with in having Mom is if I had to do you know three three or four takes, I have to redo the physical language mm -hmm. of what I just did. Um, and something you're trained in an actor is you don't ever want to repeat yourself because you never can repeat the same experience because if you are, you're living in the past and not the present. If you're not present in your scene, you're like killing this, you know, it's, it's not it's not an exciting acting. And so it's a real skill set to be able to be highly aware physically in order to hit every single mark and repeat a physical story and somehow still be present as if you don't know what's gonna happen and it be new. I mean, that's the challenge of, of really good acting. Um, on, on the stage, an actor gets to tell the whole story. They're in control in a different way, right? Because they're gonna, they're gonna come out and they're gonna play the whole scene in one take. And whatever happens, happens. And it's live, it's ephemeral. It's happening in front of an audience. Like a piece of set stuff could fall down. 
you know, when you're doing a film, it's recorded, and they can pick the best take. Um, whereas when it's live, you uh, However, you get to have the notes of whatever you crafted happen on stage uh, when you're in a film acting. It's, it's, a, it's more of a collaboration because so many different people go into making that film happen. Uh, and you're not in control of your own performance because they will pick together like different kinds of moments to create the arc that tells the story that the editor and director ultimately wants. I don't know if I answered your question the way you were hoping. Uh, you did, you did. I mean, my kind of point was that part, part of it was that you can, you can bring, you can reel in. It's easier to reel in an actor than to try to make them big. And I think that you get that in theater because yeah. it is big. It's, it's easier to bring them down, which was one, one, one thought. And the other thought is just that, you know, the, the the experience of the theater I think gives so much more to to um, to an actor's performance than just strictly on camera slash non theater kind of like performances. Which was... A different discipline, maybe it's just a practice, a different training sure. of habit of the body. Um, but sometimes the theater actors, you know, don't always know how to bring it down to a one. And so that's true. You know, that's a training process for theater actors too, to learn how to do that. Fair enough. Any questions? You don't have a question? <laughs> Actually, what's what's your long term plan for how to you want to be like a TV show? Uh, I am interested. Yeah. Um, so part of the reason I want to go to Trebekah is because they have the now creators market, and so I'd like to pitch it into a half hour show. Um, I do have someone who works at HBO that was really interested in directing the pilot, but she wanted to see some significant changes in the script that I wasn't ready to make because I think they're essential to the story I'm trying to tell. So I wanted to make this as a proof of concept. Um, it's also great for my reel. I will have footage playing the kind of role that I should be playing that actually centers me, a middle-aged woman, in the role rather than just someone's mom, um, which is a lot of what I will play. Um, supporting characters, telling other people's stories. So this get, lets me have some juicy bits um, for my for myself. Um, so that that could help me be seen in a new light or get new work. I get put in very sort of compassionate, kind, nurturing roles. I'm very angry, uh, which he knows. <laughs> so um, I, there could be a you know being able to showcase that could 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 give me some other professional opportunities. Um, but I also just had to to tell this story. Like I had to make this thing to grow into the person that I wanted to be now that I've made it. I mean, that's a great note to end on, but I don't know if anybody else has questions. Yes. Um, so we're going to be doing sort of the festival circuit for like a year, but if, if you go to hotangrymom.com, right now you're just going to see our Seed and Spark campaign. Um, in the new year, we'll put up a website, which will have a mailing list. Uh, but you can follow us on social. At Hot Angry Mom is on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. So if you start to follow now, um, we will be giving the people that backed our campaign like a previews in December, and then we'll announce wherever it goes festival-wise. I'm interested in a platform like Scary Mommy or Hoo Ha Ha, which are online platforms with millions of viewers for some this kind of content. because. My goal is really to grow my audience. It's more important than, I don't ever expect to make money off what we just created together. Um, if anything, if anyone's interested in the story, the best case scenario is that they would want to pick it up and produce it at a higher production level, uh, is what I would anticipate. But you still, still will be able to see what we created. Um, and either I will put it out if, if you know on Amazon or something smaller if I have to, or I might use a platform like that. Thank you for asking. So I'm curious, and how are you? Uh, like, it's 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 getting edited right now, and you're kind of like waiting to see this. How are you um, emotionally navigating like the the fear of like, is it going to be good? Is it not going to be good? Like, I don't know. Like, what like? Well, the word know? good is kind of irrelevant. Good, but it's, will you like it? Will it be? Will it you know fulfill? Yeah, you know? yeah. I mean, I've already accepted. Isn't we wrote one thing, we shot something else. I know we're going to edit something different. Um, just knowing that you know the director and the editor that I've brought in for this are highly skilled professionals, I, I will do my best to give over to them and still trust that the notes and, and jokes that I think are important to be seen are still there. Um, but yeah, therapy. <laughs> I, I go to therapy once a week too. <laughs> I'll keep writing. I mean, something that's kind of exciting is. Um, 
using this process to continue to write the story because I uh, had developed enough of a pitch that I know where the five seasons of the television arc are going to in this story. Uh, it's not all written out, but I have a place to go, so I can just keep pouring it back in there. Right. So you're you're writing you're writing more episodes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, wonderful. Yeah, the second episode's actually already written. It just needs to be like shaped and polished. Um, the second half hour is written, which could be a season two of a, a web series if I ever wanted to do that again. <laughs> You're like, I don't know, maybe yes, maybe no. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see how this we'll one turns out. Yeah, exactly. Is there any other questions? Uh, because my, my next question would be like, what's so what's next for you uh, outside of Pot Angry Mom? Like, what else? Are you doing anything else? Like, what are you working on? Um, the play that I was mentioning called The Baby Monitor that I went to Serbia with and we took it to Dublin is actually going to Italy for something called the Onstage Festival in November. So I get to be in a play in Italy for a couple of weeks in November, which I'm very excited about. Um, uh, I'm getting certified in something called Fitzmorris Voice Work. I mentioned it earlier, but now I'm getting certified with Catherine Fitzmorris, who created the system. Um, and so I'm hoping to offer that skill set more. So I'm like going to be subbing in for someone at Rutgers. And um, I work for an organization called Lit to Life, too. And we do international, or excuse me, national tours of solo productions of great works of literature. So the reason I was just out in Iowa is because we took the show Black Boy. Um, which we have a, a, an actor who plays like 20 different characters from that novel and we do about a 50 minute stage adaptation of the novel um, and I go along as a teaching artist to do all the pre-show, post-show, set it up, MC it, Q&A and then I teach the university level classes um, around around the story. So I have some more gigs like that coming up with some different titles and so I keep auditioning, yeah. I just had an audition for SVU last week before I left. And oh yeah, was it a good part? It was not, no. <laughs> it was fine. It was fine. I, mean, I gave up a really meaty one uh, when we were doing Hattie Green Mom. It was like what? a central character. Yeah, like, oh, it. it's so good. But, yeah. I know. I know. Uh, it'll come back around. It'll come back around. It's fine. I'm going to lose sleep over that tonight. Uh, <laughs> any other questions? No? I mean. Or if, or if you want to share anything about what you're making, I'm excited to hear that. Or something you made. I am money. too. But she's probably a little bit more excited than me. <laughs> or what you're looking forward to the rest of the semester? Um, I guess in terms of like what I'm looking for, I'm just really honestly really glad that we're in person again. Um, I know that last year um, especially, I specifically avoided taking cinematography classes, film classes here because I really wanted to get in depth with the material and the equipment, even now as someone that's aspiring, like, I'm right now, I'm like, I'm getting really into cinematography. I'm in a cin cinematography class with the only tool I have is my phone. And yet it's still so interesting to see how lighting um, can create such an effect and such a different, and now that I'm also in an acting class and about how different techniques for actors, and it's like you couldn't really get that if we were just doing things like virtually, and like obviously there's like the whole safety component to it, but um, I'm just really glad that we're doing stuff in person, but we're also keeping into consideration like the restrictions and like being safe and stuff and it's like the only thing I could wish for is if like I had access to more equipment or had access to more like reaching out to other like more actors like it's really amazing that you're able to be here and um I also have um a class with you know Noelle Wilson it's just like yeah it was just like really like awesome just like meet people like that and um get hands-on experience like that so I'm just really happy about that and I'm looking for to like more opportunities even after I graduate because I'm a senior and I'm like nervous like oh, what am I gonna do how am I gonna get in contact with people I'm just trying to you know have conversations with people before I go and graduate because it's a little harder to do that um, but yeah I'm just really thrilled about that and I'm hoping that you know like me and like other people who are pursuing things it's again it's also amazing that you guys are able to come in and share that because like I'm just like, I look up at like actors and people in the industry, I'm like, whoa, like how did you get there? What did you do? And it's like, it's really cool to just be able to hear that and have these things in person again. So thank you. Absolutely. Do you use Facebook? Um, I do not, uh, but I feel like I should. I feel like I should. Well, I, it's evil, but what is good about it <laughs> yeah. is um, there are filmmaking groups mm -hmm. and they're like New York City, Women in Film. Mm -hmm. I'm a part of NYWIFT. Um, there's different like film groups and organizations which are uh, often looking for people to work on projects, they'll need a PA for a day, or, or 
you know, skills that you might feel like if you could actually start going on to other people's like indie level sets and meet a community that way. Yeah. Um, but also, you know, people will chat about things or there'll be panels or things to go to. So there's a lot of film events. Do you live out here or where, you, where will you live after you graduate? I will probably live like in one of the boroughs, probably in the Bronx. Um, I've tried to live between Bronx, Manhattan, and Westchester my whole life. So yeah. So you're gonna have plenty of opportunities, yeah. but I would definitely say like look out for film related communities and groups to be part of. And and anytime you can keep taking classes, that's like workshops, like even one off type things. I don't know, it's a way to begin to meet people. Um, uh, Gotham, it's now Gotham, it was IFP. They used to have the Maiden Media Center, which I really liked because there were some really great workshops there. Um, but their their physical location is closed, but Gotham I don't know if it's just Gotham, New York, is a, is a film organization that uh, you can volunteer for their their uh, creators market every year, I think, and then you get like a free membership to the actual organization, but you can, there's a lot of really cool workshops, and that's a great way to begin to meet people that you might want to then collaborate with uh, to begin to make things or experiment. Right. Yeah. yeah, that sounds really cool. I actually didn't know about that, so that's really good to know. Thank you. I would, I would add Craigslist. Mm -hmm. On the um, like the crew, whatever they post jobs, mm -hmm. whether it's like a PA or sound person or whatever, some pay, some don't pay. But and there's an app. I found this out during Hot Angry Mom. <laughs> um, I can tell you afterwards, so I don't take that time. Or somebody else is talking, I'll look it up. But there's like an app for hiring people, but you can put yourself on it. If, I mean, I guess if you were going to crew up, but you probably could look for jobs that way too. Mm -hmm. oh, they don't have for everything now. Anyone else? Going once. So this is my first semester as a filmmaking minor. I was originally a theater minor, but I flipped over because there weren't a lot of acting classes available, and that's kind of what my interest lay in. So I switched over to filmmaking so I could start making my own work and putting myself in it. And I've only ever made like small scale documentary type films before. So this semester I'm taking two creative filmmaking classes. So I'm very excited and very nervous to try and make two films this semester at the same time. So I'm very excited to see where that goes, and I have like some stories bouncing around in my head that I'm excited to get onto paper. That's incredible. I'm glad that you're going to get out, like just make them, because that's how you're going to learn it, by doing it. Just, yeah. Congratulations. Thank you.